Uh, yeah, Lee's asked us to come say a few words about the project we're working on. Um, I think it's a really, really great project. Um, I'm really happy to be uh, involved in the project. Um, and you'll notice the, the title here, Innovations in Engineering Surveying. A little bit about uh, myself, uh, the presenters this morning. Uh, so my name's David Mayers and uh, also co-presenting Matthew Monk. So you'll notice uh, the title here, I'm a surveyor, proud to be a surveyor and definitely not a civil engineer. So uh, I work for the joint venture, so part of the permanent team. And as Lee said, you might remember uh, my speech from the NSIU project in 2014. Uh, that team uh, that delivered that project in 2014 were also a, a co-winner of a EC award in 2014. So I was proud to uh, I was proud to lead them. Okay, thanks. Um, so in contrast to Dave, I'm a civil engineer, so not a surveyor, um, but working on a surveying project. Um, so I'm actually doing some contract work, um, just helping the project out. Um, so I did previously work for 12D UK, um, but now I'm back in Australia, um, helping people on some of these jobs. So now we'll give a bit of a project overview. Uh, so yeah, okay, what is, what's North Connects? It's a motorway tunnel. Uh, it joins the M2 to the M1 and gets around our notorious Pennon Hills Road. Two key components, a tunnel, mainly a tunnel project, and also a, uh, a separate project, a M2 integration project. It is Australia's longest and deepest tunnel. Longer than all the Eastern distributor, the M5 and the Cross City combined. So who is delivering North Connects? Uh, we have the state and federal government. We have uh, RMS, uh, the State Road Authority, Transurban, who are the ultimate client, who have proposed this project. And we also have a joint venture between Lend Lease and Boyce Construction, uh, the contractors. Uh, one, one thing to notice about the, uh, this slide is uh, the North Connects project, which is in Sydney's northwest, it joins up the, uh, the orbital network. So you can see it's a vital link in the, uh, in the road network. A few, few fast facts about the project. Uh, it's uh, around about 16 kilometres in mainline excavation. Uh, we have four ramps in total, around about four kilometres in length. Uh, quite a few cross passages, tunnels in their own right. And four shafts, a uh, total of 210 metres deep, the deepest of which is uh, just shy of 100 metres. As you can see, two and a quarter million, sorry, two and a two and a quarter million cubic metres of excavation. It's a lot of dirt. Uh, we've got 19, 19 road headers, uh, which will be working concurrently at one, at one time, and that's a record for the country. Uh, looking at the, the, basic, the, the basic scheme of how we, we hope to um, accomplish this, as far as tunnelling goes, we've got four main sites each of which we hope to launch for road headers. So you can see we've got a site to the north, a main site to the north, a main site to the south, and two uh, sites in the middle. And here's a picture of a road header. They're pretty impressive machines, I think you'll agree. Okay, so uh, little, just to finish off the project, some, some milestones. Uh, we've started mainline excavation, uh, so we're into it. Um, early next year, we start the, the, uh, the lining works. Uh, motorway facilities starting in 2017. In 2018, the excavation should be complete. Uh, fitting out the tunnel at that stage. Commission the tunnel in, nine, in 2019 in the hope that it will be open uh, late 2019 for traffic. Okay, so now we'll just uh, talk about some of the many challenges we face on a project like this. And we'll go into a bit more detail uh, over the course of this presentation. So one of the main ones is it's a mega project. Uh, it's a large scale, um, high visibility, and there are constant program pressures. Okay, everything's go, go, go. Um, 
we also need consistency in our systems. Um, and through that comes from, we need to standardise the skills and the methods of our surveying team, how we do things, how we deliver things. We've got a big problem with data management. That's probably our biggest issue on this project. Building a tunnel's not terribly hard, um, but managing the data that it generates is. We also have interfaces with third parties uh, that we need to manage and ideally streamline. And one of our key things we're going to have trouble finding is suitably qualified and trained personnel. So, you want to talk about? We'll go. Okay, so our platform. What are we trying to do? Okay, we're trying to adopt a lean construction approach. We're trying to automate as many processes as possible. And we also want to uncouple the administrative um, housekeeping sort of tasks, you know, data management, naming files, submitting files, from the actual production roles, doing surveys. So, how can we do this? Uh, we've got five main prongs, instrumentation and software platforms, a consistent platform. We're doing standardisation of processes and centralisation of our data. We're also doing project-specific development. Uh, so that's things like macros particular to this project. Data management, again, uh, dealing with all of that. And we're also documenting and training in all these processes. So. On the instrumentation and software side, we've adopted a standard fleet of Leica instruments, uh, TS-16s and the MS-50s for the scanning, Panasonic tablets, and on the software side, 12D model, of course, and 12D Synergy. The field data that we're receiving, we're structuring, okay? So we're actually separating and categorising this by location. We have seven locations on our site surface and tunnel works. We're also separating by the type of survey, as built, set out, monitoring. We also attach the user details so we know who did what data, the current date and time when it was done. So all of these uh, bits of information about the field data are used to automate the naming of our field files and standardise the process. Importantly, they allow us to create unique and traceable field files. On the design data side, we attach the source details, so where the design data is coming from. And that includes the drawing number, the status, whether it's for construction or for information only, and also the revision, so we know we've got the latest version. We are adopting a logical model naming. As you can imagine, a project this size, lots of models. And we're looking to maybe use the grouping coming in version 12. So, and importantly, it's read-only for the field surveyors so they don't inadvertently uh, modify the critical design data. So, I now continue talking about some of the design aspects. So, again, the challenges. We don't have a 3D tunnel model. Unfortunately, we've only got road strings and they're from MX. Okay. So, we have to create our 3D tunnel. The data isn't necessarily 12D field friendly, and 12D field is what we're using across our project. We are operating in a design and construct environment, so that means frequent design changes, and they're just in time. Um, and we also have interface challenges, okay, uh, where things, you know, may or may not match exactly. So how do we model tunnels? We've always had the old PRO, PRA style tunnel definitions. Um, we're not using that on this project. It's too difficult to manage, doesn't scale up to the size of this job. So in version 11, we uh, added, or 12D added rather, tri-meshes and snippets, and we're using those as the core of our design. But what version 12 adds is one of our nice uh, little panels is to create a snippet from a profile. So we draw a profile in a plan view, we then run this panel, creates a snippet, we then create the snippet to run the tri-mesh. So here's our tunnel profile in a drawing. This is a 2D PDF. We then create this in 12D, so just in plan view. And the labels around it just used to define how the snippet is created. We then run this panel to create the snippet. 
and then it creates the snippet. All nice and easy. So once we've got the snippet, we're mostly using standard MTF, okay? Mostly standard version 11 MTF. Um, we use stretch heights, which is in version 11, and that just allows you to have perpendicular profiles. We also extensively use layers. So this allows us to attach at a given chainage, different profiles, uh, excavation, shotcrete, benching, different rock types, different support types, structural supports, all that uh, within the one MTF. Uh, it also allows us, because they're just standard links, to use the standard modify commands. So we can then model quite easily jet fans, egress or cross passages and junctions without creating a separate tunnel definition for each change. Here's an MTF. There's only re three real parts to each um, model. Let's insert the snippet, stretch the heights, create the shape. So another great thing in version 12 is we can have shapes with varying links. So the start and the end are the same, but the links between them can disappear. 12D will stitch and transition automatically. So you don't need to start and stop your trimesh, you get one continuous trimesh. We've also got a simpler syntax for specifying these links. Some of these profiles can have 100 links, and I don't fancy typing in 100 different link names. So I can instead use a shorthand to cut that down to maybe 10. And 12D expands that automatically. So I'll now to show you some pretty pictures. Um, so these are from our tunnel project. Um, you can see here we've got multiple profiles. The yellow is the excavation. The red there is structural support. Purple is the uh, shotcrete. We've got bolts as well. And the good thing is this isn't just pretty pictures. This is ready to set out with 12D field. Okay? So they're actually building off this. There's some passages, some profile changes, um, some of the more structural-like elements. There's a shaft up close. Um, so this allows them to take this out into the field. So how do we manage this? Control alignments are versioned. It's important to get those right. They're verified, so we can run a check against the design that we get to make sure it's correct. It's also tunnel definitions, so we can attach those to the control strings now. We don't need to share a lot of files, we just share the control line. We've also got this concept of a central data model, which we'll cover in more detail later on. The idea is centralised, it's restricted, it's version controlled thanks to 12D Synergy. It's automatically pushed out to surveyors with the, data, the new data sync tool. So, just some of the successes we've had using 12D model and Synergy on our project so far. On the design side, we can quickly and easily model these tunnels, okay? The MTF and the snippets allow us to have flexible tunnels, okay? If things change, we can easily change them. The versatility of trimeshes. Uh, we can model all sorts of uh, information using trimeshes. Um, it allows us to make this dumb data, just dumb 3D strings, a bit more intelligent and a bit more useful. I'll now hand over to Dave for the survey and construction part. Thanks, Matt. Um, okay, so, yeah, look, surveying and construction. Um, we've got our own challenges in general. Um, again, scale of the project, lots of people in lots of different places. Um, very hard to get communications uh, to all people at all times. Multiple and concurrent work fronts and often in a 24-7 environment. Uh, there's been a big industry push in the last few years for a demonstration of specification compliance. Um, and we've really, you know, as an industry, got to pull our socks up in terms of QA. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's hard to ignore the, uh, the challenge trying to recruit staff in the environment we've got in Sydney. Uh, you know, there's you know, three major projects and more on the horizon. There's also an inconsistency in the work practices uh, amongst, um, well, not only surveyors, engineering in general, um, and that had to be addressed. Specific to tunnels, um, here's, a, here's a couple of shots. This is the environment that we're dealing with. Um, I think you'll, you'll agree it's pretty difficult. It's, uh, it's dark, it's, it's wet. <laughs> uh, there's usually mud about, um, and not really conducive to 
uh, technology or surveying. So the challenges there, limited space and access. Uh, the conditions as we saw in the photos. And also we need to operate in an offline environment. Now we have got plans for a, to push a Wi-Fi backbone through our tunnel, but we're not operating like we have that all the time. Uh, we have to operate like this is a, a special case that we will have access. Also we're involved in critical production uh, decisions that may need to be made on site. Um, we don't have time to be returning to, say, the surface um, to make the decision to then, um, to then let the guys in the field know. We realised we needed to develop uh, a lot of better systems specific to the project. So our survey systems, now I've got to go through this pretty quickly, um, our customization of the field software um, not only does it include uh, a traditional customization, as 12 day users would know, uh, it also inc includes the use of macros. Um, there's, there's many macros that have been written uh, by Matthew that uh, enable us to, to run the three main macros for the surveying function. Um, we also need to carry the complete design model. There's no, there's no time with, with so many work fronts and concurrency. We can't be always running back to the office to get new data and new data sets. We need to carry everything with us at the same time. Automation of data management. You know, uh, often surveyors are time poor. Data management is usually the thing that waits to the rainy day. So with, uh, with so many work fronts, we can't really afford to wait for that. We need to streamline our outputting uh, and, our, and our reporting. Uh, Matt's going to run through some figures in the... Um, in the data management, but um, uh, this a project this size, uh, the amount of reporting we do is just immense. We can't afford to be reprocessing. And of course, a secure method of backing up and storing our data. So, you know, we've, we've got our own customizations for our field guys for usability um, in the field um, and in the office. Yeah, standardized our coding, which, was, which is a given. Uh, optimised our field work uh, function buttons. So the things that, that surveyors are doing every day, we've, we've made that a lot more usable uh, for them. Uh, and again, project specific macros. These are the three big macros that I'm talking about that enable us within the function to, to do our job more effectively. Now there's something like 30 macros that are, that are driving or enabling these three main macros to work in the background. But, um, you know, they've all been designed to be as friendly to, you know, the, the working surveyor as possible. Uh, touch friendly, used on a tablet, you know, no keyboard, no mouse. Uh, and also to streamline our processes. We don't want to be pressing a thousand buttons. We want, if possible, just one button to do a task. Uh, the first of these macros, that, uh, the three that, that, that are going to really um, support our function, is what we call our submit fieldwork function. Uh, sorry, macro. Um, now we run this after each individual task, so we get lots and lots of these. Uh, the beauty of this one, it performs our QA checks for us. So our guys know if they're, if they're going to hit their QA target at the time in the field. It's a, it's a real beauty. Uh, it checks against uh, G71, it looks, uh, uses a lookup table, um, it checks if our instruments are in calibration, uh, it checks data consistency, it assigns a QA class to our work, it's a big deal. That means that no one has to go, you know, looking through files to see if people have done their check shots and various other things. It, it automatically assigns a QA class. Uh, it makes sure that we haven't submitted data twice. That would be a no-no. Uh, and consistency, that's the key. Uh, it does also allow for our surveyors to be able to check if they comply and then fix, fix that up. It adds, it adds attributes to all of our field data points. So all of those individual points involved in our survey, they all get the, the QA attribute. So as that flows on through the data, uh, it'll all be saved. Exports the data for an upload, and we, we, we use an offline environment, standardised our naming convention, as Matthew said before, and produce a few different files. We zip our fi field file up so that it travels easier. We'll produce a quick little text file that gives us the, um, the ins and outs of what we did in the survey and also a CSV. They all travel together as one packet. Uh, 
It also allows for post-processing. It pushes it into an area. So if, you know, if needed, uh, our survey guys can, can uh, post-process their work fairly easily, push it on down the chain. Here's an example. Uh, you know, we can, we can run checks against our field data as we do it. It's a, it's a, big, it's a big step forward. All right, next in the process, now that we've got a field data, uh, we give our guys a chance to clean their data up, you know, tidy the strings up, um, push that through to down, down the line to the um, central data model. Again, a concept that we'll talk on uh, in a second. Uh, but also other things, uh, not only, not only um, post-process field data, but, you know, things like photos and notes and voice recordings, anything you can think of, you know, we want to capture them. Um, as I said, post-processing is something that, or a part in the process where things often get bottlenecked. Uh, there's never enough time to, you know, to post-process your your information before the next, you know, the next job comes along. Um, it's yeah, it's just a fact. Uh, this all also this this panel uh, it submits data for review and storage further up the chain, and um, here it is. It's uh, it's got many. Um, Many outputs, as you can see, uh, price processing uh, of field work is what, what we've selected here, but it, like I said, uh, this is also applicable for any other type of data. And lastly, the last part of the puzzle is uh, we need to demonstrate that we've approved or checked our data, so a manager of a, t uh, a, a particular area, uh, they'll often uh, need to approve this work, um, and not only approve it in terms of QA, but improve it to go into our centralized model and we're protecting that as much as we can it's a live model it's a uh, it's a garbage in garbage out model so uh, this is run by a survey manager um, it's it generates a QA report uh, which we're able to review when we when we're approving the data checks can data, data consistency as well we can fix that up uh, also the QA it, you know it allows us the manager to check QA uh, map and approve and get into the, the uh, CDM. Uh, another innovation we've got is that it uh, actually updates our field file in the, uh, the synergy status. So it'll update the uh, attribute uh, for that data and it will also give it a new version. And here's the panel. So you can see we can either approve or reject uh, field work there. Obviously reject, rejected field work gets done again. <laughs> Okay, so you know a few successes from using this software. Um, well, first of all, look, we've got the ability to do this. So, you know, I can't think of another uh, customizable software where we actually have the keys to do this. Um, we get really rich data, rich in attributes, um, collected at you know at at the point at which we collect the data, we can treat it. Uh, if we're on our game, we we don't have any post processing. Um, so. It's possible that we could do everything once in the field. In practicality, probably not. Uh, we, can, we can produce outputs in the field. So obviously, if we, can, if we can do our survey and produce an output, if it's a plot or a scan or whatever, um, we'd like that to happen there too. And that's, again, that's possible. That's, uh, we'll see how we go in pushing us more in that direction. And also, we can back analyze our data. Um, we've got a lot of uh, attributes that we can search on. Um, and we can use macros to do that. And all this with a reduced burden on the surveyors. So I think that's a win. Okay, thanks Dave. Um, I'll now talk about some of the specific uh, data management issues and how we solve those. So challenges, just to give you an idea um, about the size of the project. Not just the volume of it, it's the frequency of it. So we have up to 19 concurrent headings, um, like we said in the intro, never before been done in Australia on this scale. Uh, that means approximately four to 5,000 cuts, okay? So a cut might be a few metres, uh, you cut, then do something, and then you cut again the next day usually, or the next shift. We are collecting approximately five to 10 survey tasks per surveyor per day, and we have about 20 to 30 surveyors. Uh, off and running 24-7. So there's no let up, there's no weekends. Uh, this data's coming in all the time. Uh, we are adopting the MS50 to scan our tunnels. And we did a quick back of the envelope ca calculation. We're looking at about 100 million scan points per lining. 
So we have at least three linings. So that's roughly a quarter of a billion points for the entire scan of the entire project. We have approximately 300,000 bolts to install. And of course, we have to survey those and report those as conforming to the design. We also have conformance of the tunnel itself. These have to be at one metre intervals, and that equates to roughly 100,000 plots. Okay, a lot of data. The previous techniques used in tunnels, just in general, uh, construction projects are highly manual. Data is often unstructured, poorly managed. It's the last thing a surveyor does. Old habits and sometimes a bit of an outdated data culture. Wait for a rainy day to do all this. And there's the need to work in an offline and an online mode. So we have this concept of a central data model. Okay? It's a fairly old concept. It's gone by various names. Uh, the skirt guys talked about, I can't remember what they called it, but the same sort of concept, centralising their data. Um, I'd say it's probably rarely used on projects of this size, or if it is used, it may not be used to its full extent. So we have all the data is centralised. Design and historical data is sent out to field surveyors or to others. Our survey or new data is collected from the field. It becomes our one source of truth and particular for our surveying function on this project, it becomes a live as built model. Data received from the field, once it's processed, approved and goes through the import process, then becomes part of the data we share back out. So all the surveyors are collecting and getting that uh, as built data um, of the project. So centralised, it's controlled, it's backed up importantly, it's tracked, it has inputs, outputs, and it also has revisions thanks to Synergy. So here's an example, just a quick diagram of the various inputs we might have on this project. So not just field work, but design, utilities, um, tunnels, survey controls, and then we're pushing these out to surveyors, managers, other groups. So how do we collect this data? Okay, we need to standardise, standardise and automate this. It needs to happen offline or online. And so up until now, most of our focus has been on collecting the field work itself. That's the most crucial part of our data. But now we're actually starting to focus on all the other bits of data, plots, reports, and so on. We will eventually encompass all data. Okay? We hope to collect it all, uh, whether we use it or not, uh, yet to be decided, but we hope to collect it all. So once we've got that data, how do we distribute it? We are heavily reliant on sharing. Sharing is great, it's read only, it's a fixed location, and we can use subscriptions uh, to master share files to make it nice and easy. We use non-synergy sharing uh, because we have to allow that to work offline in that disconnected environment. Uh, and one of the particular ways we've made this easier is we've developed a custom macro that's, again, tablet touch friendly. It's dynamically built from a configuration file and it uses the concept of subscription presets. So here we have this panel, okay? So the user doesn't have to browse for these master share files, do a right click, which is hard on a tablet. They simply bring up this panel, put the tick box next to the data they want, hit process and they receive it. They subscribe to those data. Okay. Any one of those tick boxes is a preset, okay. and it could be one master share file, it could be many. Any of the greyed out ones mean they simply haven't downloaded that data yet, so it actually checks that and gives them a cue that they might need to download the latest data. It also allows them to list all the files. Again, they don't have to browse, they just have to tick the boxes, hit process. Okay. And that's a lot easier to use on a tablet, um, and means they get the data that they need very quickly. So, uh, file synchronisation. So we have files coming in, files going out. So how do we manage all of this? We initially tried some of the third party sync software that Richard alluded to, um, and like he mentioned, uh, we had some problems. Um, it didn't really scale that well, there are a few usability issues, and it was pretty manual. So we discussed these problems with 12D and said, hey guys, what can you do? And of course, we said we need something simple 
and reliable. Again, offline, online, it shouldn't matter. So, of course, 12D, being the great guys they are, came and developed the custom solution, okay? The data sync that uh, Richard was talking about. So, the official title for now is 12D Synergy Synchronization Tool. It's a bit of a mouthful, so we call it Synchogy. Okay. <laughs> you can use that, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the 12D Synergy Sync tool, Richard will go into more detail in one of the sessions. It is based on the 12D Synergy clients, really just an extension to it. Um, importantly for our surveyors, it doesn't require any special knowledge or training. They don't need to ever open the client, uh, it's all run from the system tray, one little icon. It is centrally managed, so we in the office can push data out and receive it. It's all task-based, so you get the benefits of those tasks. Emails, um, you can track the progress of when things have downloaded. Very critical to ensure that the data they're using is current and up-to-date. It does upload and download, and it does this either manually, so they can still do it on demand, or we can force it to, onto them in a scheduled or at a particular interval. And again, offline, online. So it automatically detects when it's got a network, connect to the server, and it'll upload. We are downloaded. syncing. We are sync. Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. We are syncing. We're syncing. What are you thinking about? <laughs> OK. So that's uh, Dave's, Dave gets a giggle out of that every time. Um, so that's all this talk about syncing. He pretends he's a German Coast Guard. So just some screenshots about this sync tool. Here it is, here's a task. Um, and you can see I've assigned this to everyone. And so it gets populated uh, using the group roles in Synergy. We can track who's downloaded it, who hasn't. There's our Synergy sync tool, just sitting in the system tray, one icon. That's what the user's presented with when they have a download task. And that description is populated by the user or the manager who creates the task. They do get the chance to either download it or not. Not downloading it doesn't really not download, it just postpones it, so it's a bit of a nagging. Keep downloading this data. So, how do we track all this data that's coming in and out and all over the place? Okay, so we have field work that's processed for review. Okay. The approval status is tracked in Synergy using that macro that we talked about. We do actually have a full audit trail on the 12D model data. So this is talking about the rich data using attributes. Okay. We had attributes at each stage, who did what, when it was done, the comments attached, time, computer, all sorts of things. And that means that every single point in our CDM can be traced back to the user, time, and a particular file of when that survey was done. Okay, and that helps keep the, keeps the auditors happy um, and satisfies our QA requirements. So here's just some screenshots again. Like I said, our, our, our model is live. So as files are coming in, they're updating this as we go. So we don't actually process this at all. It just sits there. And this is the data that also goes back out to surveyors. Here's a nice one. Uh, on the left, we have our as-built uh, shaft and the tunnel. Um, and on the right is the actual design model of that. Okay, so you can see they're very close, uh, closely matched, as you'd hope. So, what are some of the successes we've had with 12D Mall and 12D Synergy? We've been able to automate the data submission. Surveyors really don't have to think about it or worry about it. We do it automatically for them. Okay, it works offline or online. It just queues it up. When they're online, it submits it. We're getting structured and usable data, okay, uh, which is important. All survey staff are using the same base data. We don't have different versions or different copies of data. It's all the one data set that they're all using. The data is current, controlled, and it's live. It's a live model. So now Dave will talk about the interfaces and outputs. Thanks, Matt. Okay, I'll try and uh, get through this pretty quickly. Um, all right, so, you know, on this project, we've got... Ooh, okay, the challenges in this space. Um, our data is relied on by others. Um, it's a pretty big uh, burden. Uh, it has to be right, and it has to be right first time. 
has to be delivered on time. Uh, this is, you know, in the guidance and machine control, uh, specifically in tunnelling, uh, in a just-in-time uh, just environment, um, but also, you know, surface works machine control there as well. Uh, deformation monitoring, uh, that's a big uh, key concern for us. Uh, utilities mapping, uh, geotechnical mapping. Um, also, we've got a challenge in standardising our reports. Um, everyone likes to do everything their own way. Uh, we want to just do it one way, uh, the project way. Uh, we want them as much as possible to be produced at the time when we're doing the survey. Uh, it saves on time and also it's the best place to be doing it. As far as guidance and machine control goes, uh, we have data which is forward, forwarded to our road headers and as I said, just in time. Uh, we, we, we have to transmit profiles uh, and alignments and these are actually the same profiles and, in, and alignments that we use to create our tunnel data for our surveyors. So we're, only, we're able to reuse that data to push out for this purpose. We've also got drillers and uh, rock bolters, uh, same sort of data, same type. Also graders and pavers in a traditional sort of uh, surface, surface works uh, role, uh, strings and tins. As far as monitoring goes, this is a real challenge. We've got various uh, different monitoring arrays that are popping up at different times as the tunnel's going under, under various uh, um, areas. Um, and we need to start, you know, have our surface crews, if you like, go and put some uh, deformation monitoring points and get them ready for our, um, our night shift crews, say, to, to come and survey them. Um, we, we, we can have that data available to them in, as part of the CDM. So, uh, downloaded via the sync tool, available in, the, in their data set. Monitoring surveys, we also, we also upload them to Synergy. They can be copied out to a third party software, which we do. They're harvested into a, uh, a web server database uh, and uh, they're returned into the project's critical permit to tunnel process, which if we don't get that right, well, we do no production work. Uh, now, st standardising our conformances as much as possible um, you know, we've, we've this, what you can see up here is a tunnel conformance plot. Now, like Matt said, you know, we might have 100,000 of these to produce, so we need to get them right first time. Um, we don't want to be reproducing these. We need to have a format that's, that's acceptable and agreed to and then just produce them. Uh, what you can see here is some, uh, some, a few smarts that we've got, uh, the different colourings. Uh, this one's been, uh, we've got points that are acceptable, points that are not acceptable, and points that are kind of in the, in the range where we, we're okay with them. Uh, also, we've got a number of, uh, you know, like 300,000 rock bolts or something, some crazy figure like that. Uh, we need an uh, effective way to, um, to, to plot them and figure out if they actually conform to our, our design spec. Uh, we've actually managed to do this through a macro that, Ma that Matthew wrote. Um, and it gives us all the, all the figures we need. Again, we've got the, uh, uh, the, the green and red um, colouring if for, for a pass and fail and um, yeah that's a that's a fantastic initiative. Game changer in the in the tunnelling uh, environment is a heat map. Um, now uh, Mick, Mick's had a lot to do with this one, uh, in fact he did, did it all, um, but uh, what a fantastic um, uh, ability for us to be able to take a, a real world coordinate, stretch it flat, work on it and then then put it back into a, into a tunnel shape. So 3D transformation of that data, we'll, we'll take those real world coordinates, make them into plan coordinates. Uh, we can use our analysis tools, which are standard, standard 12D tools, such as tinning and range files, um, and produce a heat map similar to this one here. Um, and that's, that gives us real information. That's not an animation, it's, a, it's real, real data, which is important. Some of the successes, automated outputs, pushing as much as we can to do that. Elimination of double handling, that's where we'd like to be. Some amount of double handling will have to happen, but eliminate it as much as possible. More decisions able to be made in the field and less time spent in the office. <laughs> okay, some, some conclusions um, before we go. Uh, I believe we've developed industry-leading solutions for this project. I, we couldn't get away without it. Uh, in the current market, using old techniques, we, we wouldn't have been able to get the staff. So this is a, this is a, a need for us. 
Uh, it's also an integrated solution. Um, all of our data flows are, have been all um, pieced together so that we can deliver data to, to other parts of the project on demand. Again, flexible, customizable, as seen with our macros. Allows us for analysis down the track with our rich data and more work to be done at the work face. What this also does, by giving us live as-built models, well, it, it gives us a chance to be able to find clashes in, uh, in, our, in our designs, should there be one. And it reduces manual processing. So the future, interesting. We want to expand our automation more than we're currently doing, if we can, within reason. Yeah, further real-time reporting in the field, you know, we're heading that way. We'd like to be down, further down the path and we'll get there. Data management, that's a given. And also, we want to figure out how we can use our data to then drive better solutions down the, down the track. The data will tell us the story if we let it. And also, with number of tunnel uh, projects on the horizon, we want to put ourselves in a better position for that. Here's some of the projects that, we're, that are on the horizon. Okay, so if you, for any further information, uh, Matthew has a stand outside um, and we're both available for the rest of the conference, so make sure to come and say hello. Um, any questions, we'd be happy to, happy to answer them. That's all we have for you, thank you.